Hi, I'm Christopher Martin. I use the author name C.L. Martin. I'm going to talk about utilizing direct use geothermal energy to improve roads during winter conditions in the Reno Tahoe region. A little bit about me. I did my undergrad here at San Diego engineering geophysics. I'm a SAGE alumni that's Summer of Applied Geophysical Experience. I studied magnetotellurics, uh, geophysical surveys, and I did graduate work at UNR, the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, geothermal geophysics. I did the National Geothermal Academy modules, uh, consulting and geothermal geophysics. I'm trained at LeapFrog 3D modeling and Phoenix Geophysics UMT surveying. And this year I started geothermal uh, business doing surveying consulting. So the Reno Tahoe region in uh, California, Nevada border is right there on the map. So why should we do this? Um, there's geothermal, we need to use that. There's moderate to harsh winter conditions in the Reno Tahoe region and it's good for the environment and actually saves us money as I'll show you. This is a three radical scenario of a pipeline running from the Eastern base of the Sierra and that's looking west into the screen. So the objective here is to locate a problem geothermal website at the Eastern base of the Sierras. Design a pipeline that transports geothermal energy up towards Lake Tahoe and construct and maintain the system. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. There we go, okay. So uh, background of this whole project, uh, city council member of South Lake Tahoe found out that I started a consulting firm for geothermal reservoirs and they, so they approached me and asked, hey, is it feasible to use geothermal to melt the snow and ice off the roads? Because they're, you know, every time the roads close, they're losing millions in tourism and so forth. So I took it upon myself to research the, the project and became interested and found out, you know, the more I researched it, the more multifaceted it was. It's not only involving geothermal, but the engineering behind, you know, is it feasible to do it on the roads? Plus, um, as I'll show you, the politics involved and everything else. So I wrote a paper on it and it was published this year in the GRC transactions. And I'm also contributing by, um, uh, you know, the geophysical surveys and so forth to locate the proper wells to see if it's feasible. So uh, out of the three types of geothermal energy, uh, direct utilization is, is what this is. And uh, now's a good time to say that, especially in this region, direct use geothermal is grossly underused. It's virtually non-existent. N not too many people are doing it at, at all. So. Uh, this is a good project uh, to move forward on direct utilization. So um, in the Reno Tahoe region, there is the pepper mill, which sometimes GRC is at, and they actually use direct use uh, for this, from the same magma source for heating their hotel. So this would be along those lines. Uh, basic geothermal principles of the Reno Tahoe region. Um, here you see meteoric waters from the Sierra Nevada. Now looking into the screen is looking south. So to the west would be on the right of the screen. Uh, you see the Sierra Nevadas um, and the meteoric waters that sink down and get heated by the magma source and come up along the fault lines and the fractured zones and also move laterally in blind geothermal spots. So that would be uh, an extension of the Walker Lane geothermal area. So, um, and this would be classified by the IGA, International Geothermal Association, as a CV2 geothermal play type. So that's you know, fault fractured zones that we would harness the geothermal energy from. Um, this here shows a geothermal data cluster map from the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology. The blue areas are where we have data, geothermal data of uh, temperatures from about 50 degrees Celsius to 160. And the darker blue clusters, um, like the one in the upper middle is where Steamboat Geothermal Plant is. And they're estimating possible temperatures up to 225 degrees Celsius. And this is from one to three kilometers deep, even deeper. So basically uh, north south is uh, along the eastern flank of the Sierras. And so this is a map here of where 
forest lands are and BLM is in uh, yellow and the ranch lands are in the orange. So these would be ideal spots to target for geothermal leases and so forth. And when you match those up with the data cluster map, you kind of get a better idea of where it would be ideal to target a well. Um, from my understanding, it's required that uh, environmental social impact statement is done. Um, and this is on the Nevada side, mind you. I think if it's the California side, it's a lot more involved with the permits. Uh, choosing a geothermal well site, this is where my expertise is using broadband UMT uh, magnetotellurics to identify the, the substructure of the geothermal reservoir. And it's imperative to conduct these geophysical surveys, not only the MT, but also overlay it with gravity surveys in order to really get a clearer picture on exactly what the substructure is. So this is a result of a 3D MT map. And it's kind of like X marks a spot where we'd target the, the hot fluids to, uh, you know, in order to reduce the risk of uh, missing the geothermal reservoir when drilling. So there are four scenarios that would be ideal for this sort of project. One is Kingsbury grade, and that would be just south of Carson City, which is the capital of Nevada. And you see here on the map, the red circles indicate the geothermal data clusters that were previously shown in the Nevada Bureau of Mines and Geology, um, the blue circle map. So you have Kingsbury grade, and it's like a smaller road. A major road would be Highway 50, sink a well at the bottom there and then run the pipelines up. Mount Rose Highway, more of a tourist thing, whereas Highway 50 would be tourism and trucks. And then Highway 80 would be the big challenge. Now Highway 80, uh, they lose a lot of money every day the roads are closed because of a storm. I'm talking millions per hour. So, but the problem with Highway 80 is the geothermal well targets, um, there needs to be some more research as to exactly where to drill for the temperatures desired for this sort of project. Um, designing the closed loop circuit that runs under the road would be either PEX pipe or CVPVC for higher temperatures, and they would be two inches below the road surface. Uh, the design geometry depends on the road structure. Um, if I go back to the slide, it would, it would be mostly um, interconnected on the higher elevations, whereas the lower elevations that don't get as much snow might not have the complex geometry. Um, the fluid in the pipes under the roads would be composed of a 50-50 ethylene glycol mix, it's basically antifreeze. So that, and, and that's necessary um, just to keep the, the circulation in the pipes and so forth. Um, bridges, need more complex geometry when designing it because bridges build up way more ice. So, and that's a picture of uh, a bridge over Highway 80 going through Truckee, if you know the area. Um, Aver Technologies, which has a big presence here this year, um, is this uh, designed for the closed loop system. And I think it's imperative we have a closed loop and not a conventional injection. So we actually, are harnessing the well and we're not uh, harnessing the heat and, and not mining the water or anything like that and not uh, affecting the environment. So um, as far as the equations go, this is an equation for the geothermal heat output required to melt the snow. So the first term is, is the heat output and then the sensible heat transfer to the snow is Q of sub S. Uh, Q sub M, the heat of fusion, and then the last term is the area of uh, uh, snow-free area uh, compared to the total area. And usually we can drop that term if it's uh, completely covered in snow, especially if the heat system in the pipe is uh, pre amped like they, they run the, the flow rates a little higher prior to a storm coming. So that way it's, it's, it's preheated. Um, and so if you have the, the geothermal output uh, from the well minus the heat loss in the pipe, radial heat loss due to the, the pipe high heat capacity, minus the heat required 
to melt the snow, as long as that's above zero, then we have a functioning system, which the temperatures that we have available between 50 degrees Celsius and, you know, up to 100, it would be wonderful if we get over 100, but not over 110, say, for PEX pipe, um, the heat capacity is 120 degrees Celsius. After that, the pipe starts melting. You don't want that. So if there was higher heat in certain areas, we'd want to use the CPVC, which is more expensive, but has uh, you know, up to 180 degrees Celsius, but doesn't put out as much heat. Uh, so, so the order of operations here, you assess where we do the well, we select the well, we design the system, we construct it and maintain it. So the third step here is actually constructing, maintaining the system, drilling the well, installing the closed loop system, installing the pipe circuit in the road and installing the heat, the plate heat exchanger, which exchanges heat between the closed loop system uh, of the well and the roads. So here's a picture of Highway 50 going down from the summit into South Lake Tahoe. In fact, this area was, <laughs> the area was burned recently when the fires came through. Um, so, uh, it's important to note that they do rip up the roads like every you know, five, six years or whatever it is. So the idea is that to cut the cost, why not install the pipes during the time they, they rip up the roads, right? So that way, you know, kill two birds, one stone. Um, the question is asked sometimes, well, you know, if, if they're gonna rip up the roads, you know, periodically, won't that affect the pipes? Well. <laughs> if you put the pipes in the geothermal system works, then you don't need to rip up the roads as much, right? So that answers that question, you know, theoretically, of course. So the components, geothermal well, the water pumps, the heat regulator, the, the plate heat exchanger, closed loop binary pipe system, the, uh, and then a monitoring system would be ideal. Um, spend the money and be like fiber optic system, make sure, you know, there's no cracks or anything, but also, if there's cracks, probably see steam coming out um, and a, a minimal maintenance crew. The geothermal well itself, very small plot of land that, that does, it's not a, an involved power production. Um, you know, very little maintenance required, but um, I always promote that anytime a geothermal well is sunk, that uh, regular uh, geophysical surveys, you know, every five to 10 years or so be conducted in order to ma make sure the system is engineered correctly. Okay. Because thing because the, the plumbing could change. Um, the plate heat exchanger you see on the right, the one required for this sort of project would be a little bit bigger, but essentially it would be the mechanism in which the heat from the geothermal well is exchanged through the pipes to the road circuit. And, the, and both of these images are from the, an example of which this has been done in Klamath Falls uh, ten, over 10 years ago. So in all, this is the model we would be basing the project off, which is the closed loop system for the geothermal well, the plate heat exchanger, you can see the little uh, black obelisk, <laughs> and then the, the red arrows indicate the, the pipe circuit. Uh, under the roads. So, and then at the top would be pump houses. Um, the examples that they've done this in Japan in the 60s at, at a flow rate of 40 to 50 gallons per minute at temperatures of 76 to 83 degrees Celsius. And this was done about, you know, not very long distance, just about a mile. Whereas, you know, a lot of these projects that I mentioned would be uh, an elevation increase of 1,500 feet, about 500 meters, and um, a distance of maybe maybe 10 miles one way, maybe back. And with the proper flow rates and the temperatures, you know, it would, it would function um, according to the math. And then Argentina, a lot higher temperature, and this is way higher elevation um, up in the, the uh, Andes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, a uh, lot, of, lot of snow, so that really helped there. And that was done in the 90s. At the same time, the Klamath Falls um, system is intact and that is still functioning this day, but mostly for the Oregon Institute of Technology, which 
uh, major proponent, Dr. Blunt, did uh, his papers in 2005, which a lot of my papers based off of. Um, uh, this is, you know, created for that Institute of Technology that he worked at. So the environmental impact is good. Saving uh, fuel on snow plows, maintenance, road safety, road repair, neg negligible water loss due to the closed loop system, and the system itself lasts uh, about 50 years. So little maintenance required unless, you know, pipes crack, earthquake or something. Uh, winter maintenance um, for the roads, you know, we use snow plows um, that cost fuel and salt in, in that district is district three of uh, Caltrans and it's estimated they spend almost half a million dollars on salt alone per storm. Okay, so when you're talking about losing millions on tourism and the trucks that go up, then you know the, the money uh, is definitely saved doing this project. Uh, the benefits, the roads are consistently the winter eyes. Uh, we're using geothermal energy, renewable energy source, Okay, carbon footprint. Um, it's virtually limitless heat. Um, you know, we're we're using all you know, close to 100 percent of the heat as opposed to you know power production, which you know they're working on, but the much lower, like around 10 percent, right? Uh, no shutdown requirements. We can constantly run the system, although when there's not a storm, running at uh, lower flow rates, and then of course when there's bigger storms, higher flow rate and pumps. Uh, low impact on the environment and uh, uh, maintenance is low. Um, challenges, the initial expenses of the, you know, the survey design and installation, um, especially the closed loop system, um, a little bit higher cost than like a conventional well with the directional drilling and all that involved. So, um, you know, that the, the initial cost of the challenge. Um, interstate politics, interesting issue because the wells, the geothermal is actually on the Nevada side. The road's going up to Tahoe and Nevada side, but the people with the, most of the money, Caltrans, the tourism board, even the trucks, they are on the California side. So there's some um, interstate uh, agreements that have to be made, uh, not my forte. And then the construction at work uh, is a challenge and it only lasts uh, around 50 years. So after that, we have to look at repairing it. Um, so the initial budget, it's uh, for the pipes itself, it's about one to two million dollars per mile. And again, we could cut back that cost if we're doing the pipes at the same time they're fixing the roads. Um, the land purchase depends on those slides earlier if we're using BLM lease and whatnot. And then the, the well itself, it's conventional wells are one to two million, but the closed loop could be more. So in all, the project could be upwards of 25 to 30 million, upwards of 50 million, which in the long run, a lot of people wouldn't see that as a significant uh, cost for a project like this. So that in many people's minds is uh, feasible economically. So the results would be one of the four scenarios and this image shows uh, the purple line would be going up Highway 50 from Carson City and that's a major route from the Reno airport going to South Lake Tahoe, where the casinos are and the tourism and so forth. Um, so these direct use projects, I think are really important. Again, it's grossly misunderstood, especially in this region. So my future projects I'm gonna be working on, uh, look, um, looking into a, establishing a plastic recycle plant. It turns out we could recycle three of the six uh, uh, plastics uh, with the temperatures that are available in that region. Uh, plus, I'm looking into water and wastewater treatment. And uh, you know, open the questions. That's it. Thank you. Sure. I'm, I'm actually more open to short questions. Any longer questions, I'll be out and about if you want to come talk to me. Because, yeah. Are there any questions from the audience? Sure. Hey, Chris, uh, first off, great presentation. Thanks. Um, my name is John, I'm with City of Boise, and, and we're looking to venture into some more enhanced snowmelt systems. Great. But, but we run into all kinds of challenges, mainly, I mean, under these roads are other utilities, 
you know, that, that's where some sewer lines, water lines, gas lines, fiber optic lines run. And then also, um, you know, uh, the, the, the highway departments aren't very happy about these ideas because now there's a, the network of piping that are in their roadways. And so anytime we, we think we're getting to first base, we, we have to kind of negotiate these, uh, these maintenance agreements. And uh, basically, if anything happens now, basically we're in charge of the roads. Right, and, right. And, and so, so we've kind of gotten away from the roads where we're more in sidewalks and in driveways and kind of uh, alleys and other parts of right away. But there we have to still enter into these maintenance agreements where if, uh, if anything happens, we're responsible for, for replacing it. I guess, my, I guess the question is, how do the highway districts, how are they responding to this? And, uh, and how do other, the other utilities respond to this? Uh -huh. Well, well uh, again, the, the tourism board, City of South Tahoe, they would be the ones funding it. And then they have their own um, Tahoe Transit uh, Association or Authority, TTA. So they have their own road maintenance that they fund um, from the state and the state of California has a lot of money and then the Caltrans, but again, the geothermal and a lot of the roads are on the bad side. So, um, so as far as that goes, I'm not really sure like how that would all play out. The city council member assured me that he was the one who'd be in charge of handling all the politics and I would just be the science guy and show that the science works, sure. you know, and then try to push it forward from there. But, um, yeah, and um, I would say that in your case in, in Idaho, I don't know if they have a tourism thing. I know they probably have a lot of trucks going through there that, you know, the trucks, the truckers unions and whatever, if they were interested in keeping the roads open so they could keep the millions of dollars flowing through that area, then they, have, they would be interested in allocating some funds to that sort of, you know, uh, realm. And that's the best I can answer your question. Maybe we can talk more offline. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's, so let's talk more about it after. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I will say that there are some questions in the Q and A um, part too, but we can either get to those at the end if there's time, or um, Christopher, maybe um, after the session is over, you can log in and, and answer them um, in, within that Q and A. 